Hi everybody, it's Lisa from I Dream in Soap. You may sometimes hear people say that they're really disappointed with the colours in their soaps. Maybe they've morphed or they've faded. Maybe you've experienced that yourself. Now to start off with, before you think about doing anything else, always make sure that you're buying your colours, whether they're micas or pigments or whatever, from reputable suppliers. Make sure that they are safe to use in cold process soap and also make sure that they're stable to use in cold process soap. The environment that soap goes through when it goes through its saponification is a really harsh environment and not all colourants can survive. So let's presume that you've bought your micas or pigments um, from an appropriate supplier. Does that mean that you're home and free? Well, not necessarily. There still can be some problems. Now, a lot of good suppliers will actually have reviews and maybe little swatches on their websites, or you'll get reviews from other customers. But depending on your location, say for example with me, I'm based in the UK, our reviews are really very few and far between. And the mica suppliers that we get to use quite often don't actually have the colour swatches available for us to look at. Now you can potentially come across a whole host of problems. Um, some of the classic examples are things like purples and browns. Um, those are quite notorious for ending up as grey in your finished soap. Also as well, thinking about the differences maybe between the types of colorants that you're using. So here I've got an example of a yellow mica versus yellow oxide. Now both of these were made up at exactly the same rate, one teaspoon per pound of oils. But you can see the yellow oxide is so much darker than the yellow mica. And again, by doing this testing, we can see that we would therefore want to use this oxide at a much lower rate to achieve the result that we wanted. There may also be times as well when you custom blend a colour for a specific project that you're doing. So as you can see here, I was mucking around trying to get some sort of nice sky blue colours and I noted down what ratios of different colours that I used and I've kept a little swatch of the colours and that way I know if I want to produce that colour in the future, I can do that and I know what result I'm going to get. Okay then, so let's start doing our testing. So you're going to need to make up some soap batter. Now I do tend to use my normal recipe. You may find that some people advise just using some cheap oils to test your colouring. The reason I use my own recipe is because I want to know what the colours are going to come out like using the oils that I use. And depending on the type of oils, you might have um, a soap batter that's more green tones if you use a lot of olive oil, or perhaps it's a lot lighter if you use a lot of coconut oil. So I do think it's important to test with your own recipe. You're also, fairly obviously, going to need the micas or pigments or whatever it is that you're going to test. Now you may be doing a big batch of testing just so you can get some nice colour swatches to use going forward. Or it may just be the testing that you can do of maybe a new mica that you've got in. If you're going to do that, just test that when you're already making a batch of soap. And then something to make your little test swatches in. I use these 20 gram little sauce pots. But you can get little moulds, little round moulds. Just check the um, diameters on them though. You don't want to be producing whole big bars of soap um, for each of these swatches you're going to use. Now, I'm not a fan of single use plastic and these are obviously plastic little pots, but I've had them for a long time and I've used them over and over and over again um, and they seem to have lasted really well. So I'm pretty happy that I'm going to get a lot of good use out of them. Make sure you mark up your containers in some way. Maybe a bit trickier if you're using some sort of silicone type mould. These little plastic pots are great. I just write on them in a permanent pen. And then I do stick a little bit of sticky tape over them. And what that does is it means as you touch them with your hands, um, that doesn't rub off that um, marking that you've got. Because what you don't want to end up with is a whole load of pots all mixed up and you haven't got a clue which marker you've put into which. Now I actually put numbers on my containers rather than the names of the micas and that's because that's the way that I store my micas. As I get a new packet I pop a number on it and then they're just stored nicely in numerical order so I can find them easily. 
Time for some calculations, I'm afraid. I test all of my swatches at one teaspoon per pound of oils. So what I've got here is I know I want to make 20 grams of soap batter. I know my oil percentage in my standard weight is 72%. So that means I'm gonna have 14.4 grams of oil. Now I do work in grams because I'm in the UK, but also I find it a lot more accurate because you get much smaller increments. So my pound of oil is that 454. 4. 454 grams is the same as a pound of oil. So I divide that by my 14.4 and I know that I'm going to have 31.5 um, of my little pots of oil in a pound. So therefore basically 1 32nd of a teaspoon. Now that's no accident that I've ended up with this result because I've done quite a bit of testing in the past and I know that my smallest measuring spoon is this little diddly 1 32nd of a teaspoon measuring spoon so I'm going to be using that for measuring out my micas. Okay so measuring out all those diddly willy little spoons of micas obviously I'm going to speed this up and cut a big chunk out so I'm sure you don't need to see me measuring out all these endless little pots. with them finally all divided up I'm going to squirt a diddly little bit of oil into each of the little tubs and then pre-mix all the micas. You probably can't see it because of the speed the film is running at but I am actually making sure I really clean my spatula off because we're dealing with such tiny weeny bits of micas I do cleaning off between each pot just so I make sure I'm getting true colours only in those pots. Now time to actually add the soap batter. I'm not going through how to mix up the soap batter, I'm going to presume you know that already. Again, I'm being accurate with my measurements. I actually put my pot of batter on the scale, tear that down to zero, and then rather than keep swapping the little pots and things about, I then take some out and watch the weight go down on the scale. Now I don't pour the full 20 grams of batter in straight away. I pour a little bit in, and then give that a really good mix round because I have found in the past that when you're doing these tiny weeny little amounts in these little containers it's you quite often get some mica stuck at the bottom so put in a little bit first of all give it a really really good mix in and then once you're happy with that you can top it off with the rest of the amount to take it to the 20 grams give it its final mix and then you know you've got a good thorough mixing of that mica and then repeat for all the pots Then when I've got all of my pots mixed up, I do shut the little caps on them and I pack them all together as, as well as I can and I wrap them in a towel and I put them in my oven to seep pop them. Again, the reason for that is that I want to treat these little samples in exactly the same way as I would treat a loaf of soap so I can get my result as close as possible. Now it's really hard to actually get tiny weeny little amounts to gel, so that's why I'm trying to pack them all in next to each other, wrap them all up, pop them in the oven and hopefully I can get a closer result as I possibly can. Then the next day I unwrap them all and pop them out of their little pots. Now you could just leave them like this, it would be absolutely fine, but I like to just um, plain mine nice and flat so that when they're stored they don't knock off against each other and get all scruffy. So all I literally do is I go through with my planer, I plane the tops and bottoms of each one. And then I take an old biro that doesn't work anymore and I just engrave the number of the relevant mica onto the swatch so then I don't muddle them up. So I have an 
ended up with quite a few scraps and trimmings out of all of my testing um, but I am going to use these in another soap there's a couple of things that I would typically do with these as you say I'm going to use them in another soap and I've got another video which I'll link to that to show you how I've used them but also sometimes what I do the scrappy little bits that I perhaps don't want in another soap I will then scrunch them up into a ball and then maybe a week or so later I'll then just do a little test with them under some water and that way I can just see if the colour bleeds or come off, comes off on a face cloth or anything. So that's another useful test that I might do with those. And then finally, I'll leave them out to um, air a little bit. Now they don't need to cure fully because you're not going to be using them as proper soap. But they do need to be nice and solid so they're not just going to damage each other and knock each other in the storage. So I do leave them out for a good couple of weeks. You can still use them during that point when you're trying to choose your colours and then I'll pack them away. I use these um, poker chip boxes. They're just the perfect size for holding your swatches in. You can arrange them by colours or however you fancy and then you can see through the lids to see what colours you've got to help you choose your colours for your soap. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found some of the information in it useful. If you have, then please do leave me a thumbs up. Also, if you've got any questions, queries or comments, please leave them in the comments section below. Thank you for watching everyone. Happy soaping!